Daniel Priestley, thank you for joining us on the podcast again. Really appreciate it. Glad to be back. Thanks for having me back. Yeah, awesome. So I'm going to give a quick recap for my listeners and my viewers because, you know, you do so much. Um, so just a quick recap. So Daniel, you're an entrepreneur, started at the age of 21. You built a, a multi-million pound event marketing company before the age of 25. You're CEO of Dent Global, which has helped and worked with over 3,000 plus companies globally. You're an author of many books, called the, including The Key Purse of Influence, Oversubscribed, Entrepreneur's Revolution, 24 Assets. You're a public speaker, and you've also given back to charities over 450,000 pounds that's raised for different charities. You, you do lots more. I know you, um, you know, I really admire your work in the training space. And um, last time I was in Alcudia, the sunny beaches. And today it was pretty sunny outside, so I'm okay with that. But, you know, I really want to get you back on because I know you've got a real good knowledge of experience for, for our listeners. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, last time you were on holiday, back when you were allowed to be on holiday. Yeah, it was interesting because uh, I can remember, I, I actually remember because that was the first interview I actually did remotely. And, um, and I, don't do many, I don't do many remotely. I try and meet the, meet the individual. We were going to meet in London, but then things changed. Yeah. I did it on Zoom and it did all right. And I thought it was all right. And then since then, we've got our own studio. But I'd never have thought that Zoom would be my next, like I've done so many interviews recently and Zoom is my best friend at the moment. But it's crazy. How crazy is it? It is, yeah. Yeah. So I want to start because I picked up on a post that you did um, on Facebook, which you mentioned that April 2020 will be stuck in, in your memory um, because of the change. And you, it's a really honest, honest um, post. And I really appreciate that because I think honesty is good in business. I think it's good that we open up. Uh, but, you know, you mentioned you're in the deep end of the water. Just, um, just for the listeners and even myself, just talk us a bit about that experience. And I know you've since you know, come out there and started strategizing, but tell us a bit about that, that experience. Yeah, so April 2020, I said that we were thrown in the deep end and we learned how to swim laps of the pool um, in one month. So um, a pretty core fundamental part of our business uh, for the last 10 years has been running live events um, and, uh, and delivering to our clients in, in live event forums, running boardroom sessions, uh, having people come to London, um, you know, very, very much everything being live. Uh, and our business plan was about opening up lots of cities. So we've got an office, you know, we've got offices all over the world. We've had, you know, uh, a great office in Singapore and in Florida and uh, Toronto and Brisbane, Sydney, Melbourne. So, you know, very much running live events in each of our cities and having a team in each of our cities. Going into this, we had, you know, dozens of events globally scheduled. So very rapidly, we had to switch across to online delivery, transform the way that we... Um, deliver value to our clients, make sure that people feel a great sense that they've had a good experience with us, um, uh, that we've, you know, that we've kind of made the most of a bad situation, but actually, ideally, that we've gone beyond that and even delivered something, uh, something actually pretty, pretty powerful. Um, so in one month, we did a lot of change, a lot of transformation. Um, we took a lot of our stuff and, and uh, created different versions of it, new ways to deliver it. Uh, new ways to connect people. We recruited globally 15 coaches. Um, you know, we, we just, I mean, goodness, it was like every single day we were like achieving eight things yeah. and um, got to the end of the month and the list of stuff that we'd done in one month was just extraordinary. Yeah, and I think the key thing there is the adaptability. You, you moved quickly. Yeah, it was very much hats off to my team. Adaptable team, people who very much, they understand the vision of what we're up to. They understand what we're trying to deliver to our clients. Um, they understand the experience and the brand. Um, and the whole team rallied together um, to, to adapt and to transform. Um, so it was very much a team effort. And, and um, hats off to my whole team uh, for, for the way that they responded. Um, net result, we ended up with um, actually 19% more revenue than we normally would for the month or that we projected and about 20% less costs. Um, and obviously, we're going to reinvest a lot of that money into the, you know, building a business that, that can deliver a lot of support to anywhere in the world. Yeah. Do, do you think now that you've adapted to that kind of model, do you think the model will kind of stay this way or you, you think you'll go back to the old I would say old ways. God, it's only been a few months, but do you know what I mean? So is this if you imagine, yeah. If you imagine that the government uh, issued a, um, uh, a law that said everyone has to wear roller skates, 
for, uh, for, for two months. And if you want to leave the house, you've got to wear roller skates. Well, leaving, you know, in the beginning, there would be a lot of people who said, well, I just can't get around on roller skates. Roller skates are too hard. I never learned to do roller skates as a kid. And then two months later, everyone's really comfortable with roller skates and they can roller skate just fine. So the, the crazy thing is, is if we had have tried to do this sort of high tech delivery um, previously, we would have got a lot of pushback from our clients and people saying, actually, it can't be done and I don't like it that way. And I've, you know, I've never learned that way before. Um, and because the whole world, you know, millions and millions of people, or hundreds of billions of billions of people have all had to do things a different way for a period of more than a couple of months now. Um, I don't think there's going to be a going back. You know, there is actually no such thing as going back. There is no reverse gear on time. Everything is always going forward. Um, so I think what we'll do is we'll go forward to uh, a, a new way of doing things. I don't necessarily think that that will never include live events or that we, you know, that live events wouldn't be a part of a very important or significant part of, of where we're going. But I do think that the world is going to reorganize so that live events have a different purpose or a different role and that actually a lot of uh, strategy or learning can happen online, whereas the live events perform a real role of rapport building, connecting, yeah. um, a two-way forum rather than sitting passively in an audience really letting the audience express and talk so i think there's going to be some shifts to what people expect uh from a live uh, event experience going forward but look you know the thing about these being crazy times realistically they're not that crazy here's why <clears throat> 10 years ago we had the global financial crisis 10 years before that we had 9 11 and, and the global um uh, dot com crash 10 years before that, there was the fall of the USSR and um, there was an oil crisis. And then before that, we had the 1987 stock market crash. Roughly speaking, every 10 years, there's a major event. Um, and the more we have a globally connected world, a major event's going to have a flow on effect to every single person on the planet. So about every 10 years, uh, going back for hundreds of years, something big happens that disrupts people's lives. If you add to that, that every single 10 years, you're going to have some disruption to your personal life, whether you're having children, whether a loved one is sick, whether you personally get sick um, or an injury. Uh, if you um, have a supplier go bankrupt and that has a huge flow on effect to your business. If you have a, a business partner who, um, who you have to buy out of your business because they're not performing, all of those things happen and they pretty much every 10 years, you're going to have a world event that disrupts you and you're going to have a personal event that disrupts you. So realistically, anyone who's not expecting to be massively disrupted two times a decade is living in la-la land. Yeah. And in business, you know, um, you know, you've been in business, business of some, I have as well, and you have these shocks all the time. I can remember you losing one of our big uh, multi-million pound contracts with a fashion brand that we supplied for 10 years. That was a bigger economical shock to me than anything because I thought I was out of business. You know what I mean? So this is... Oh, totally. You know. I've got a friend of mine who in the global financial crisis, leading into the global financial crisis, he thought to himself, I am so lucky that I have major corporate clients that will never go bust like AIG and Lehman Brothers. Yeah. <laughs> Literally, you couldn't pick two worse ones. But, yeah. um, you know, th th like this stuff happens and... Uh, you know, you gotta you gotta see yourself. If you're an entrepreneur, you gotta see yourself as like a surfer, and you surf the waves you're given. You you know you have to just surf the waves, you know that uh, that come along. And if you expect that every single day is going to be a perfect, perfect weather and you know easy waves to surf, it's just not reality. Yeah, and let's be honest. Everyone's talked about a recession for the last god knows how many years, and you know it's going to come. People it's have been come. warning recession for since two thousand and sixteen, right? Two thousand and sixteen, yeah. you had Trump and you had Brexit, and people were saying, "Well, these are going to be massive unknown events, and we don't know how that's going to work out." And if you're here in the UK, you know we've had Brexit talks for yeah. for year upon year. Yeah. If you weren't ready for a recession, what the hell were you thinking? Yeah. You know, I mean, you know, the, the, whether you, even if you're pro Brexit, just, you know, removing yourself from the largest trading block in the region is probably going to cause some disruption, even if it's three or six months. Right. So realistically, if you were, if you, if you went into this, uh, 
I am utterly shocked, to be perfectly blunt, I'm utterly shocked that most of these large companies that are Brit big British companies are begging on their knees for, for help and support after just two months of disruption when we had three or four years worth of very open discussions about Brexit is going to be a disaster, get ready for it. Um, you know, okay, it wasn't Brexit that's done this, but you should have been ready because it was coming. Yeah, yeah. and I've, I've, I just find these big corporations are just saying, because we employ X thousands of people, the government are going to bail us out, which is a wrong way to look. Because as small businesses or medium-sized businesses, no one's going to bail us out. We have to have a plan yeah. in action. It, it, it is absolutely the wrong way. What government should do is bail out the employees. And the government should say the shareholders have gone bust. Yeah. But the company is in administration. We can appoint an administrator and find a new company to buy it and become the new shareholder. We already have laws that have existed for 100 years to cover that. Yeah. Why on earth are we saying, because people think, the general popul population, they think that if a company goes bust, then it closes its doors tomorrow. Sometimes that happens. But realistically, for a big company, it's totally possible that you could say, all right, we run the business in administration for up to nine months while we find an alternative, uh, an alternative purchaser. And sorry, if you're a shareholder, you're a shareholder, that's the risk you took. Yeah. Um, and you didn't keep enough cash buffer. But what are we doing? We're training CEOs to keep no cash and just to aggressively, you know, stay big enough, too big to fail. Well, they buy a lot of these, I think a lot of the, the money, they're buying back their own shares, weren't they? So they kept inflating the company by buying shares rather than yeah, keeping that. Yeah, because they're all they're all getting paid on share share buybacks. Yeah, which is which is well, I think that's a loophole anyway. But you know, looking at the the winners and losers, because you know, like you said, we can prepare. There is some industries. I speak to a lot of business owners. I work with a lot of business owners. Hospitality um, is difficult. I know a travel company that I work with. They're struggling because no one can travel. I mean, in your sort of network of so many business businesses. And it's hard to say, where have you seen the winners and losers? And then, you know, people, where have you seen the adaptation in their businesses? Have you seen anything happening with your companies you work with? Yeah, for, the very first one is that the winners are the people who maintain an entrepreneurial mindset, despite what happens around them. If you, if you, you know, I always say that there are three mindsets that you can have as an entrepreneur. You can be a reptile, a monkey, or a um, entrepreneur or visionary. The reptile wants to fight, flight, freeze, freak out, run and hide. Uh, the monkey just wants to tinker and pretend nothing's wrong and just tinker with the way, you know, check the emails, check the social media accounts, make some safe phone calls. The visionary entrepreneur wants to reinvent the future or invent the future, wants to reverse engineer the best version of the company possible. Um, and, you know, in winter, I go snowboarding. In summer, you know, I go hiking and play tennis. Uh, I don't go snowboarding in summer and I don't go playing tennis in winter. When the economy goes into a terrible situation and a downturn, there's acquisitions to do. Um, there's ways to cut back so that your business is lean and, and trans, you know, transformational. There's ways to innovate your products. Um, there, you know, it's a good excuse to look for a better supplier who can better serve you going forward. There's all sorts of great ways to run the business as a result of a big shock. Um, I, I think it's personally, I think it's per, pretty, it's not worth talking about what industries or all of those sorts of things, because ultimately every person has to make their own decision based on their own experience. So, you know, there are some people who've got 20 years of experience in the travel industry they need to figure out what's of value, what's not of value, what intellectual property is needed for the 2020s, what's not needed for the 2020s. And they've got to build a business based on their mountain of value, the, their last 10, 15, 20 years. Imagine someone in the, in the um, you know, I see it all the time, people who throw away what they're good at in order to go chase Bitcoin or AI or machine learning or, you know, some, some weird new trend that they know nothing about and they think that being 10,000th in line to the throne is going to be worth something. And it's like, you are so, you know, by the time something is an obvious trend to everyone else around it, it's all, it's far too late. You know, the, the people who are already on the inner circle have already, they already know each other. They're established. It's a tight knit group. Forget about it. Um, so you've got to play your own, you've got to play your own hand and you've got to play your own mountain of value. You've got to, you've got to tap that mountain of value 
that you've built up over the last 10, 15, 20 years. Yeah, and I've seen a lot of businesses innovate, like you said, getting on with it. Because, you know, look, you get hit initially, then you've all your sleeves up, even with my team. We got on with it. had a day where I thought, why is it happening? And then you get on with it, don't you? But I've seen a lot of businesses where they've been, how can I say it? They've been, it's been so good for so long, and they've taken their foot off that pedal. And now yeah. they just, like, I've seen food companies doing takeaways at a loss because they want to keep the custom there. And they know the loyalty there, they'll build it. Where I've seen other restaurants who just think, you know what, we'll just ride this out. And I think that's quite a dangerous because you have to keep in touch with your customers. You have to keep helping them because they'll move on, won't they? So, you know, you have to, you have to keep innovating all the time, like you said. I think it's really important. Yeah, I think, um, I think that you need to use this time to think about what is the business that's right for the 2020s? How would my business look five years from now? And how do I start that process now? Um, you know, in 2010, we began the rollout of 4G. Uh, everyone went, rushed out and got themselves a smartphone. Um, and the smartphone had a GPS device in it. And that fundamentally disrupted industries. So we didn't know it at the time in 2010. But what, what was happening is the birth of Uber, uh, the birth of uh, Tinder, the birth of Instagram. You know, the fact that everyone has video, camera, uh, GPS, um, you know, touchscreen, cloud computing, all of these things all in their pocket. This little device in the 2010s massively disrupted so many industries. And if you're sitting there as a black cab driver saying, oh, well, Uber's not going to impact my industry, it's like, really? Yeah. I think it might. Um, so you have to start thinking about things. I'm not sitting there saying that you, when I say you need to focus on your own mountain of value, I'm not meaning that you just make no changes and you do what you've always done. I mean, you look at yourself and you say, okay, what do I know? What am I good at? What contacts and networks do I have? Um, what could I innovate? What could I change? How could I respond powerfully based upon the levels of insights, connections, methods that I have up my sleeve? Um, so you don't sit there and say, okay, I'll just keep doing what I've always done. You have to change, you have to innovate, but certainly going and chasing a completely brand new trend uh, is, um, is pretty pointless. Yeah, and history has, has shown that. You know, it's shown that in every industry, in my industry, when in recruitment, when everything went to e-fulfillment off the high street, you know, history doesn't lie. Innovation will happen, it's guaranteed. And if you don't innovate, I can remember when I started my podcast, I think it was two and a half years ago, and people say, Jay, why are you doing a podcast? What's the point? You know, why you got a studio? Why are you investing? And now everybody wants to do a podcast. Well, you know, why are you getting all these guests? Why are you interviewing these billionaires? Because I've built the track record of doing it day in, day out. And now, yeah, it's easier for me to do that. But now everyone wants to do a podcast. So you're right. You've got to try and look forward anyway, but you've got to use what's available now. Do you know what I mean? Like digital assets. You talk about 24, you know, 24 assets and stuff like that. You've been mm. talking about it for a while, to be honest, uh, Daniel. You know, yeah, so. yeah I'm, I'm about 10 years in telling people yeah. you have to develop IP, IT, media. You know, your business has to be intellectual property, mm. media assets, technology assets, software. Uh, and you've got to double down on this stuff. That's the surfboard that you're going to surf these waves on. And if you're not surfing on that surfboard, you're not very scalable these days. So yeah. if you sit there and go, oh, I, you know, I don't really have any media, any IP, any technology, okay, great, but you're going to be locked into a local market. Um, yeah. And also, it, it's, you have to put time and effort to learn this stuff as well. So it's not a case of, you know, yes, you can do it, but you know, I've learned so much over the last three years about videos and how to do them, et cetera. So, you know, you, can't, you have to go in hard as well, you know, do you know what I mean? So you have to give it time. You can't say, you know, one day I'm going to be a media company. You have to learn it like you learn how to walk, basically, don't you? Yeah, exactly. And that's also the fun part. Like, yeah. it's actually fun. You know, I've got this saying with my little boy, he's five and a half, and um, we always say the fun part's building it, not having it. Yeah. And what we mean with that is that when we're building the trains or we're building Legos, the fun part is building it. But once it's finished, once it's done, it's actually not very fun having a set of trains that are all set up or having a piece of Lego that's all built. The fun part is in building it. And we came up with that saying because he's got two younger siblings, little boy, little girl, who love to wreck everything that we create. So five and a half year old spends half an hour, two hours putting together some Lego city. And then the little ones come in and knock it all down. And then he gets upset. But then he looks at me, he says, 
oh, that's right, the fun part's building it, not having it. Oh, nice. And it's a great lesson because when you think about the funnest times in your life, it's not when everything's going smooth. It's not when, you know, uh, it's all just perfect smooth sailing. It's actually when you're learning, it's when you're developing, when you're creating, when you're innovating. Uh, you know, it's those times that actually are, are the most fun. Yes, and it's interesting because, you know, you're so right in that. You know, I speak to, uh, we have this influencer company, marketing, we do brand deals. And when I speak to the influencer, they've got like 8 million, 9 million. They actually preferred it when they were going on the journey of getting the viral videos. Now it's just, the, oh, they've got to do it. Do you know what I mean? And yeah. um, even when I started my business all them years ago, I can remember the fun parts of the crazy stuff we did. Totally. When, yeah. when you look back on your life, you're always going to notice those times where you didn't know how things were going to work out. Yeah. And you didn't, you know, you didn't know whether things would, would, would uh, go the right way or not. You know, yeah. how some of the funnest times in my life was when I first moved out of home and was, living, you know, going to university and, you know, a super exciting achievement was finding a Chinese restaurant that sold mm-hmm. at the end of the night all the food that hadn't been eaten yeah. and you could buy for $20, you could buy just tubs and tubs of fi- Chinese food and, and you could freeze it. And we used to, you know, we used to basically make these huge Chinese evening feasts, invite all of our friends around, have play, play sport in the back garden and, and eat Chinese food. And, you know, everyone put in $3 each uh, to yeah. the banquet. And it was like, you know, these were good times. So, uh, yeah, I just think there's, um, you know, there's a lot to be said for, for having, having fun building it. Yeah, hundred percent. So, look, we're gonna go uh, just a little bit on on two thousand. I want to compare two thousand eight to now. I know we've talked about you know the changes and what's happened. Do you see, compared to two thousand eight? Because we can look back and you can look back. Do you see what difference do you see? I know obviously the virus is here, but do you see it as a similar challenge, or do you see something a bit different? So, when people compare the different types of crashes, do you know what I mean? Two thousand and eight was a liquidity crisis where essentially the biggest companies in the world, the banks and the funds and the insurance companies didn't have the liquidity and the whole financial system was about to come crashing down and the governments of the world had to pump liquidity into the, not just the rich, but the richest of the rich, you know, the top, top, top of the, the absolute top of the system needed to be, you know, supported with liquidity. But what was interesting about that particular time is no one ever said, don't go to a restaurant, don't fly on a plane, uh, you know, don't shake hands with someone, don't, don't have more than a few people in a boardroom together. So the wheels of business pretty much kept turning as normal, but there was a made-up liquidity crisis. Try, try and explain a made-up liquidity crisis to a 10-year-old, right? So it's not real, it's just something that's made up. Um, whereas a virus is a very real thing that has been a human existential threat for the last 200,000 years of our species. Um, And unfortunately, you sit there and, you know, we've now had two to three months of don't fly on planes, don't don't have gatherings and all this sort of stuff. And the issue that you have is that every 21 days, people reset their habits. If you change people's habits uh, for 21 days, they form a new habit. So we now have a situation where people are not in the habit of getting on planes. They're in the habit of getting on Zoom calls. Yeah. They're not in the habit of eating out at restaurants. They're in the habit of cooking, cooking meals. Um, so we're, we're changing people's habits. And the longer this goes on, the more you actually will fundamentally change the way people buy and shop and uh, work. All of those sorts of things uh, are, going to, um, are going to happen. Uh, so look, 2008 was uh, was a massive you know i remember 2008 really it was 2012 the government was still bailing out the system yeah. four years later uh and i think we're probably going to have a bit bit of that as well um it's always going to be a rocky road this decade it was always going to be disruptive uh number one we we know in the uk we we're always going to have brexit yeah. so brexit is going to be a big disruption in fact theoretically as soon as we're over this we have to start talks as to how to break up with our biggest trading partners. So, um, as a you know, as a country that has seven or eight percent of its GDP tied into the European market, um, and that's just actual sales, not supply chain. Uh, you know, that's that's coming next. Um, we also have a situation where Germany 
has a huge um, aging population. You know, average person who's ger average German person is 48 years old now. Uh, the average Brit is 40. Uh, the average French person is 40. Um, the average person in the world is 19. So we in Europe we have a very much an aging population that needs support and care, um, and that's going to be a huge issue. We have technology that's going to replace people. One of the big things that's going to happen as a res result of COVID is that at first, for about a year, everyone's going to say, isn't it great we get to work remotely? Yeah. About a year later, all the biggest companies are going to say, hey, if we can have remote workers, why don't we have much, much, much cheaper workers in the Philippines and in India and um, in South Africa? And, you know, let's just kind of like put our workers all over the place. I think, I think COVID is going to spark a movement out of urban cities because a lot of people are in London, for example, because it feels like you can only have a good job if you're in London. Outside of London, there are just no good jobs. And what's going to happen is that a lot of people are going to say, actually, I can get a good job, but, um, or they'll say, I can do any job remotely. I'd rather earn 65,000 um, pounds living in a bit more of a nicer area than earn 80,000 pounds living in London. So they'll take a pay cut and they'll, you know, they'll bring this amazing urban experience that they've got out to a more idyllic location. So all sorts of changes are going to happen, but they were going to happen anyway. Technology was going to happen anyway. 5G, AI, all of that was going to disrupt industries. The aging population of Europe was always going to be hugely disruptive, um, you know, because, uh, because when the social care system was created, there was seven people working for every person in um, in retirement now there's two or three people working for every person in retirement and we're soon going to be two people working for every person in retirement you know these sorts of things are big changes um, so COVID, COVID is a disruptive force but the 2020s were always going to be a disruptive force so, so based on, on that do you think there's going to be like with the recovery now do you think it'll be slow and steady rather than you know obviously you know the, the, the v-shape or the u-shape because um, the government at the moment are paying like obviously the salaries for a lot of companies in fact uh, just near me in Derbyshire Derby uh, Rolls Royce who are a big big employer here they're releasing 9,000 staff which is quite a big hit for a local local city so massive massive so and also they say for every job loss there's four others and I wish these uh, bulletins were more focused around that rather than Dominic Cummins it'd be nice to you know focus on the people who are going to lose their jobs but do you so in your in your sort and of the one person who refuses to go <laughs> yeah exactly it's crazy isn't it and it tells you where the media is at um so do you think you know based on that it'll be a slower recovery rather than you know obviously no eight we knew eventually came back but people some people expect a v recovery and i don't know if that's realistic um so i personally don't think there's going to be a recovery so i i feel like disruption is the new normal and that you have to you have to get good at very rapidly changing, pivoting, because the idea of a recovery sounds like everything goes back to normal and it's all nice, smooth sailing and we have this lovely kind of everything's working and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. But, you know, I think in the short term, and when I say no recovery, I mean, I, I think for the next five years, we're going to have, you know, for example, there could easily be, number one, there could easily be a, um, uh, a, a second you know, spike of yeah. COVID-19. It could adapt, it could change. You could have a virus. A year from now, we could have another COVID virus. Um, we keep cutting into rainforests. We keep coming in contact with animals that we've never come in contact with. Um, you know, it used to be that a virus kind of broke every 15, 20 years, and then it was every 10 years, and now it's every five years. So it could be that every two years, we end up with a killer virus on the, on the loose that we have to do a lockdown. Um, you know, the more we cut into rainforests, uh, the more we're going to see that sort of stuff. Um, and the more you do industrial farming. So then the, you know, the other side of things is that we're moving so many people in, into retirement. We're moving technology uh, where one AI system could suddenly be invented that does the job of tens of thousands of people in the economy. And it's just like, we just don't need truck drivers anymore. We just don't need any. We don't need any cab drivers. Everyone who earns their money through Uber, we don't need you anymore. Uber's just done an update and we're just going to have self-driving cars from now on. Yeah. So I, I, I feel like 
if, if your brain is hungry for a recovery, tame it to not care. Like, just don't care. Maybe there's a recovery, maybe there's not a recovery. My personal opinion is I'm not worried about that. I'm building my own economy, right? My own economy is the Daniel Priestley economy. And everyone who's in the Daniel Priestley economy globally are entrepreneurs who want to stand out, scale up and make a dent in the universe. They want to use their business as a force for good. They want to write books and create media. And if you're, if you're up for that game, if you want to play that game, there's 7.9 billion people in the world or something like that. Um, uh, there's a bigger middle class than ever before. There's more PhDs than ever before. There's more master's degrees than ever before. There's more millionaires than ever before. Uh, my whole business revolves around having a few thousand clients. So if I can't find a few thousand clients among 7 billion people, then it's not the economy's fault. It's my fault. So I'm, I'm not looking for, I'm not, I don't care if there's a recovery or not. Um, and I'm training my brain to stop looking for one. Um, my, my belief is the 2020s, there are so many big disruptions lining up, getting in queue, waiting to disrupt the world. And, um, and actually, you know, it's, it's just become the, I, I kind of think disruption is just the new norm. Yeah. And I hope, you know, people watching my podcast I've been doing, I've interviewed a lot of people recently and it's a similar line of message. In fact, David McCourt, who's a telecoms, the billionaire of telecoms, yeah. he said exact same thing. He said, you know, for every 10 people in a job, eight, eight people ain't going to get the job back. And you've got to kind of look forward and see what you're going to look like on the other side rather than waiting for something to happen and going back to normal. Because like you said, okay, fair enough. let's say we do go back to normal. Let, let's say that happens. You've still got all the Brexit stuff. You've got 5G coming into it. You've got so much along the line already. And, you know, we're a global economy now in the sense of, you know, this yeah. gig, gig economy is happening for ages, just that we're yeah. now going to be part of it. Yeah. By the way, one of the things that I think is um, an incredibly powerful thing that is happening is that you end up with a lot of blue collar workers where their jobs are coming back. Um, and then you end up with uh, white collar workers where their jobs are actually going to be over outsourced or deprofessionalized through AI. So um, one of the one of the things that I'm seeing at the moment is that there's a real trend towards manufacturing close to markets and actually bringing manufacturing into the UK and into the USA. And uh, you know, manufacture like I, it wouldn't surprise me if iPhones get made in Mexico, um, et cetera, et cetera. But one of the things that I'm also seeing is that white collar jobs are going to get replaced by AI and people in the Philippines and, and people in, um, you well, know, it, it, all, that, all over the place. It's interesting you say that because I think that's happening already because uh, Rolls Royce, who again, are, you know, big employer in the UK, um, they were making redundancies prior to this because of all the changes. And the biggest cut was middle management. So, yeah, and the reason for saying. the reason for middle management is because management is essentially not a value adding layer management performs a function of coordination of labor so it's managing labor so if you have 25 technicians building something you need someone to kind of make sure everyone's working on the same things and doing performance reviews and making sure the quality's there and all that sort of stuff but with software now one manager it used to be that you needed one manager to manage eight people and then you added a bit of technology and you can have one manager uh, managing 10 people that doesn't sound like a big shift but across a big organization, that means you need 20% less managers. And now technology is coming in where one manager could probably manage 16 people, which means you need half the number of managers that you used to need. So that middle management layer, the more technology that comes in, every time a manager picks up their phone and goes, isn't this great? I can manage people using Slack and I can use monday.com and I can have online learning systems and I've got automatic dashboards that update themselves isn't this great? What they should actually be thinking is, isn't this terrifying? Because it's either me or the person next to me that's going to have to go find something else to do. Interesting. So Daniel, we've mentioned obviously the disruption that's coming and we know that we can see it happening. So for entrepreneurs listening or watching this now, and they're thinking, okay, great. I get that. Um, I want to follow Daniel's philosophy of going at it. You know, I recommend reading the books by the way, because it's still relevant uh, as they are all the time. Um, where do you see the opportunity? I know you mentioned um, looking at innovation or something. Is there any specific you would like to yeah, say? He, yeah, so the, the big specific one I would say is that about 100 years ago, the biggest opportunity 
uh, was definitely consuming consumable products, fashion, alcohol, food, um, you know, things to put in your house, you know, chairs, rugs, cups, all of those kind of things made, made great opportunities. You know, if you look at Mr. Selfridge, um, you know, setting up Selfridges and Mr. John Lewis setting up John Lewis and having all of those kind of um, meeting people's consumer needs. Yeah. About 30 years ago, it really changed towards meeting people's investment needs. People were making more money out of investment properties, uh, brokering finance deals, uh, floating stocks on the stock market, putting together investor funds for angel investors and VCs. So investment type products became the number one way to make big money on the, on the, on the, in the world. Look at Ray Dalio and, yeah. you know, um, you know, Warren Buffett and even how, how did, you know, Bill Gates really make his money was around creating uh, he, he Bill Gates said, my product isn't software. My product is Microsoft. Um, you know, he, he said that he's, he was building a, a, an investable business. So that was, in, you know, investment-led. My belief is that entrepreneurs are now moving into a phase of purpose-led. So it's the United Nations Global Goals. The, if you want to find the number one opportunity magnet in the world right now, go find one of the United Nations Global Goals, the biggest problems on the planet, build a business that solves one of the 17 humanitarian or social issues in the world. Um, and or, or or environmental issues in the world, and go and check that out. Now, Elon Musk today, right on the 27th of May, is launching humans into space to go to the space station. It's the first time Americans have launched from American soil in 40 years, um, and it's not governments that are launching people into outer space. It's entrepreneur. It's an entrepreneur who's who's overtaken NASA. Yeah. Right. So. Apparently, he's saving the U.S. government forty billion over the next two years by doing launches to the International Space Station and all that sort of stuff. Um, so, essentially, the biggest opportunities for entrepreneurs is replacing the work of governments, replacing the work of humanitarian and social, uh, and 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 finding ways to solve big humanitarian problems, big environmental problems. There's a young kid who's pulling plastic out of the ocean. And he's created a boat that automatically removes plastic out of the ocean and puts it in these giant um, containers. You know, he's selling that system for tens of millions of pounds to every council, every government in the world that has to pull the ocean plastic out. Um, you know, there's so many examples of this now where people are making seriously great businesses that kind of address huge social problems. So it used to be consumer, consumer products, investment products, and now it's actually humanitarian, environmental, social, purpose-driven products. Yeah. And, I, and I'm assuming on a smaller level, if you've got a small business, then um, yes, look at the bigger 17 major you know, things that you can help with. But on a, on a smaller level, you want to innovate within your space. So look at yeah, how... Look, and you can always find a cause in your local area. You could, find, you, could, you could essentially commit to taking 10 people off the streets who are homeless in your, in your area. Um, you could... Uh, organize a plastic cleanup in your local forest and park uh, and, and do something like that. That will actually have more impact these days than a marketing activity, yeah. um, like running ads. That'll, that'll, that'll do more in the community than, um, than the marketing community. However, I will say this. If you've got a small business, why? Why are you playing small? Like, why not have a bigger business? Why not, you know, it's actually, I personally find it's harder to keep a business small now than it is to make it go big. You know, as soon as you start putting content out there and, you know, look at, look at your podcast, you know, you've created a bunch of podcasts. Uh, I saw an episode that you put up not long ago and it's got over a thousand views. It's an, it, it's a two hour episode or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. So that's 2000 hours of networking you've just done um, where you've actually gone out and ha and built rapport and had a networking experience with, 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 a thousand people for two hours you've actually done two thousand face-to-face meetings as far as people are concerned you've you know with this we put an hour of our time into it um and then it goes out a couple of hundred people might watch it it's a hundred to one leverage yeah um like you know it's it's fun it's it's cool it's great it's it's exciting why on earth play small this is a great time to play big yeah, and also with, 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 with the interview now, we've just recently moved to YouTube and we've got 35,000 watch dials last month. But our main audience is from the podcast. So just by repurposing the content, 
we can we're reaching tens of thousands, hundred thousand people from a conversation. So, so you you look at it like that: a hundred thousand hours of um, of watched hours, right? So it used to be not that long ago, two thousand fifteen years ago, twenty years ago. If you wanted to connect with someone, there was only really two options: there was go and connect with them face to face or on the phone, one to one. Yeah or become a celebrity, become famous, like write in a newspaper, be on TV, be on the movies, be on the radio. But there was only really the, the proper big mainstream platforms or go and meet people, you know, one-to-one. And yeah. if you kind of have a look at it like this, right? Here's a little, I'm just going to play with my calculator. There's 260 work days a year. There's eight hours of work days per day. So there's yeah. about 2,000 hours per year that you can work. So that's it. You got 2000 yeah. hours. Uh, if you use your time in a linear way, you can connect with 2000 hours worth of people. If you put one video, one decent video that gets watched by 2000 people for an hour, you've actually done a year's worth of networking where it's the same as if you had gone networking for every single hour of every single day for a year. And you've done that in one video or one podcast. Yeah. Um, so, so you know, I'm glad you mentioned that point because because a lot of people ask me, Jay, you don't do many public speaking, and uh, you know, I started doing some public speaking maybe a few years ago. I did one talk, I think, just before the lockdown, and I've saved. I'm going to put that out because people think I don't do public speaking. But I said, for me, if I can do a podcast with somebody that can add value alongside me, and I can reach you know thousands of people, then it's silly for me to go out and speak in front of maybe a hundred people. And I'm not saying that's a bad thing. I think it's, it's good to it's do funny. that. You've, you've hit a point where the leverage of one to a hundred isn't enough for you anymore because you're yeah. sitting there going, but I could have put that onto a podcast and it would have been one to a thousand. And it's recorded and, and I can repurpose it. So I'm not saying it's good, but I can remember doing the gigs when I first started off, but I was doing speaking gigs and, you know, initially you just do it voluntary to give back and it zapped my whole energy. And I mean, really, and then, and then we weren't recording it. And someone said to me once, Jay, that was an amazing talk. And I can remember the next few days thinking, oh, I didn't even capture it. You, know, you, know, you have the moment. Yeah. So, I mean, that's why podcasting is, is good. But like I said, Daniel, like everything you said in your books of Keepers of Influence, you know, people ask me, how do I get great guests on? You know, like people like yourself and people like all these guys. I actually tell them, you know, I've built a business for like 20 years, 10 years of my story. And I put that to the guests. They say, look, this is what I've done. This would like to bring to it. And a bit like your book, you know, you build your brand and then you approach guests. And I've never, ever once paid for a guest. I don't believe in that. I feel like they share the same values, you know. Um, so, again, you know, build your brand and you can use digital stuff to yeah. get to more people, right? And you know, I'm sure you agree with that. A hundred percent. Yeah, absolutely. Good. Look, I always love talking to you. One thing I want to touch on, Daniel, because, you know, we talk about the training industry and, you know, there's a lot of good really good stuff in your stuff's really good and i recommend reading your books that key uh, person of influence is such a great book i've got it there look i've still you know you can see that's a uh, great for, book for this interview yes. yeah no i was i was you know always but i was flicking through it today and i was like going through it refreshing myself because there's so much good stuff there it's basic stuff that you can do to build you know i'm not plugging the book by the way daniel's not paying me for this and plug the book plug the book <laughs> buy from the book but you know i want to thank you for the podcast look you bring so much value I'm just listening to that. You left so many values of points on how to do it. And uh, I can't wait to get this out and get this out to the people because I know people will be excited by this. So uh, thank you for joining us. Danny, before we leave this podcast, where can people follow you? Uh, well, you can read one of the books on Amazon, um, on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and all of those sorts of things. Um, and also at the moment, uh, I've got about 900 copies of Key Person of Influence in my storage shed, which we're clearing out. Uh, yeah. about 40 boxes of them so i don't know how many people will listen to this and i don't know whether we'll actually have these going at uh this deal at the time but you'll have to email our office info at dent.global if you want a copy of the the book we'll just literally we'll send you one um you just send us your uh name and mailing address and we'll send yeah. you a free copy of the book no strings attached uh we're just cleaning stuff out at the moment so um excellent uh, so feel free to feel free to email info at dent.global and we'll send you a book. Good. So we'll put that in the show notes, put in the links as well. Thank you for that, Daniel. I'm sure my listeners will appreciate that. Look, I've read the book. The book is good. It's not like, I mean, if you want to build your, you know, your influence, you've got to start taking action. So thank you, Daniel. I'm sure we're going to have another one, you know, maybe, maybe on the other side of this. Um, that'd be great. Thank you. Cheers. So thank you for watching that video. If you want to see other videos and great guests, 
make sure you subscribe and like the video. So you can now head over to my website where you can see a bit of my story of building and scaling my businesses and also all the free resources and tools which you can help you on your journey in your brand and your business. You can also subscribe on the podcast so you can check on iTunes, Spotify and other locations where you can find the podcast. And I look forward to catching you very soon. Thank you.